There we go. I think we're on. And people are starting to pop in the room. So uh, welcome, everybody. Another. Oh, looks like Dora just popped on. There we go. Coming in at the end, hot landing. <laughs> <laughs> hot landing. Yeah, so for, for everybody that's just kind of jumping in and joining on, this is another uh, harasses event with Frank. Always fortunate to be involved in these. They're pretty exciting on a global basis. And we're going to do just the, the classic panel introductions. Go around the room, quick little introduction, background. Uh, keep it short and sweet for us if possible. That'll get us right into the content. And we're going to talk about Bitcoin, speculation, bubble, solid investment. We'll probably talk more investment strategy and we're not going to ask for price predictions. I think that'll let everybody off the hook, including the attorneys. You know, so speaking of, of attorneys, let's start with Steven. I'm going to go on mute and uh, let you guys go around the room on quick introductions. Great. Thanks, uh, Stephen. I, this is Stephen Wink. Uh, I'm a partner at Latham & Watkins. My background is a securities regulatory lawyer, and uh, I'm also now uh, co-chair of our global blockchain and crypto practice, uh, which we've been uh, we've had in place for about five years now. We've been doing a, a bunch of different things from really all sides of, of the market, uh, from, from representing all the major exchanges to uh, token projects and um, and, and, and NFTs and everything else. So, um, yeah, that's that's my view on this world. Next. Great. Yeah, I'll go next. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So I'm uh, Chen Arad. I'm CEO, COO of Solidus Labs. We're a New York-based firm that specializes in crypto risk monitoring. We provide uh, crypto-native market surveillance, transaction monitoring, and other uh, solutions that help exchanges, uh, broker-dealers, and essentially anyone who is exposed to risks associated with crypto trading uh, uh, to uh, 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 monitor for, detect, investigate, uh, report, and ideally prevent uh, a, a fraud manipulation and other forms of uh, abuse in crypto markets. A, and that's uh, where I'm coming into this from. Perfect. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Anton Golub. I am a CEO and co-founder of Flow Technologies, Flowtech. We're a Swiss-based market maker for digital assets, for coins, cryptocurrencies, and tokens. Originally, I came from the high-frequency trading background. Uh, I was a market maker, high-frequency trader in the foreign exchange markets, worked for governments and the regulator on advisory side and research, and then also was at the right place at the right time, and back in 2013, co-founded one of the first blockchain companies in Switzerland, where I ran a digital asset exchange and issued one of the world's first security tokens that was tradable in the secondary market. And today, with Floftech, we're helping those tokens get liquidity and bring liquidity across a wide spectrum of exchanges around the globe. Uh, perfect. And Gerard jumped in, so go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, if you, if you get it fixed, Gerard, I'll, I'll bring you in here in a second. Um, but I'll, I'll at least start... Starting with the question. So if you guys saw the panel, the, the, the panel topic sort of could take us down two lines. One is talking about is Bitcoin an investment? The other one was really, is it a currency? Is it going to be regulated? I have my own ideas and philosophies on that, but let's, let's start down the line first. Uh, again, starting with the attorney, is Bitcoin a currency? And if so, does it need to be regulated? Well, you know, big news recently, of course, was El Salvador announcing that they were adopting it, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, for, as legal tender. That actually impacts the, the treatment potentially in the United States, because if, if another sovereign recognizes it as a currency, that really uh, makes a difference here under our law as well. So um, I, it's a huge first step. You know, in, without that, it's not a currency in that sense under most law because there, there is not that sort of uh, you know, legal tender issue in most, most uh, countries as far as I'm, I'm aware. Um, so you know, that's, that's, all, that's kind of been a, a thorn in its side, frankly, for, you know, since, since inception, which may be uh, you know, kind of cured with this. Um, as far as does it need regulation, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think another recent event that um, impacts that discussion is the announcement yesterday that the Department of Justice had recovered 
uh, <clears throat> some of that uh, crypto that uh, I, I guess it was Bitcoin uh, that um, uh, was taken in the ransomware, recent ransomware um, uh, event with the Colonial Pipeline. And, um, you know, I, I think if, you know, if ransomware really continues to ramp up, um, you know, I, I would imagine uh, governments could get very aggressive in regulating this area. Um, you know, it probably, uh, so I think it's probably a positive that, uh, you know, that, that, that there is this uh, announcement so that, you know, maybe that tamps down the ransomware uh, activity um, somewhat, at least. So, you know, I think, I think that, uh, that that could be you know helpful in, in kind of fending off some additional regulation, but that would be the main concern I could see is you know you know governments deciding at a certain point that look we need to you know handle these sorts of illicit payments and, and that sort of thing. you know we've seen more and more of that and you know there's more sort of AML regimes that are being adopted around uh, the world, but you know that you know aside from that I think. Uh, uh, you know, that, that'd be probably the most likely area for regulation. All right, let's, uh, Dora, I'm going to bring you in here in a second, but I, can you I hear read me now? That, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can yeah. hear. Okay. I, I, read, I read that article, as I'm sure most of you guys did, and part of me, Stephen, said, wow, this is great because I've had some crypto hacks out of Barcelona and I'd love to lock the wallet or get back. And then part of me, as I'm old enough to be skeptical, I'm thinking, is it vaporware? Because the article said they had private keys and access, and I'm thinking, did they really have that, or is they, you know, was it a vaporware press release saying they did? And you know, I don't know the answer, but it'll be interesting. You know, let's transfer over to Dora. Give us uh, the introduction background, uh, and then once you're done, I'll lead the question with you, and then we'll move across Chen and Anton. Pretty Apologies quickly. again for the connection. Uh, this is Dora Islam. I'm the CEO at Genesis. Uh, my background has been uh, always in capital markets, uh, managing funding and crypto treasury. Uh, currently, I'm very focused on um, uh, launching and adding new products on the brand broker services for Genesis Global Trading. Uh, Genesis is a New York-based uh, broker dealer. Uh, we have multiple entities globally, the service clients across multiple markets in spot derivatives, uh, lending, and uh, custody. Uh, nice to meet you all. Okay, perfect. So let me come back to you on the question. Let's let's roll over though. Chan and Anton, I see you guys shaking your head somewhat in agreement with Stephen on a few things, but you may have a, a different idea. So first, it, you know, is Bitcoin a currency? And if so, should it be regulated? And I won't even throw in the buy home. I, I personally don't believe it's a currency. I don't believe it should be regulated at the bank. I believe it should be classified as an asset like a stock. Uh, you know, banks don't custody stocks in the U.S. I don't think they should custody <coughs> cryptocurrencies, which are penny stocks. Uh, you know, that's my own philosophy. But but Chin, let's go to you. Same question. Is it a currency? Should it be regulated? Well, you know, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's hard to go on this after Stephen because I'm no lawyer uh, in terms of the legalities of the question. <laughs> but I do think that there's a fun fundamental question here. And, and, and thank you, Stephen, for bringing up both the uh, El Salvador announcement and the ransomware, uh, a, 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 you know, the fact that the money was captured. Because, because I think it's, it speaks to, you know, one of, the fundamental, one, one, one of the fundamental questions when it comes to crypto and one that we deal with often, the, the question of balancing the merits of, you know, Bitcoin and other digital assets and the many risks. Um, you know, if you look at how the El Salvador announcement was framed, it's really quite exciting, right? Because the idea is that it would, you know, be very relevant for 70% of the population over there that is unbanked. This is exactly some of the you know most important ideas behind crypto, right? Making finance more accessible, um, and and uh, and I guess and, and and one of the ways to do that is also considering it as as legal tender and as re and really as a currency. But at the same time, uh, you know those are assets that introduce many many new risks, uh, and uh, it was very cool. And I'm sorry for being a bit. Uh, casual here, but it was very cool to see that governments are becoming more and more comfortable in realizing that there are ways to mitigate the risks. You know, that's what really, uh, you know, our solutions offer when we when we work with clients. It's really about not limiting crypto through, you know, very aggressive risk monitoring, but rather, uh, you know, finding ways to enable its merits and mitigate the risks, whether it is used as a currency or not. Um, and, and again, I will leave the, the legal question there a little further, but 
uh, the key to whether it can be used, can, whether it can be further adopted as an asset class, uh, you know, I'm closer to your opinion, Stephen, in, in that regard, uh, or as a currency, is in uh, making sure that it can be used safely, but also not limiting, you know, the very exciting opportunities it offers to make finance uh, more accessible uh, and efficient. Yeah, and, I, and I've looked a lot at Australia, and I'll roll to you, Anton. Australia has done some interesting things with regulation where they've actually looked at it smartly and said anything under $1,500 is just payment. It's not tax. It's not an asset. So if you want to use Bitcoin or any fungible you know, token asset, it's basically a form of payment that's just payment. Over $1,500, they are treating it as a tiered asset. And the more you make, the more you're taxed. It's almost like a, a, a waterfall capital gains tax. So I, I still think there's some interesting things coming out. But Anton, again, same question, currency and regulation. And then I want to move into just some of the next stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. I mean, first, just to mention from a practical perspective, from a technology perspective, even though kind of Bitcoin was envisioned, even stated it was a peer to the vision was an electronic peer to peer network. But I think everybody who has actually first been experienced the technology knows it will never be used actually as a payment infrastructure, or at least in my view, even more kind of potentially be used as a store of value or something of that sort, but definitely not a payment. Guys, hang on, Anton, sorry. Kind of how are... that approach is very yeah. early on, which was in 2013, and then implemented in 2014, was Bitcoin was recognized as a payment instru instrument. So it means today, actually, Bitcoin in Switzerland is viewed the same way that euros or dollars or yen or, or any other currency is used. So meaning that also reflects on the how you actually apply, apply capital gains. I mean, you don't actually. So there's no capital taxes actually. If you just hold your Bitcoins and you don't trade it, yeah. So I think in that context, Switzerland was very clever early on to recognize that this is a big opportunity. So let's try to embrace it. And always very important, Switzerland never passed new laws for that, but implemented it within the current regulatory structure. And that was a kind of a success story, in my view. And that's the reason why today the famous Crypto Valley even exists and why the companies go there in Zug or in Zurich, because you can literally set up a company, not even have a bank account, put up capital in Bitcoin, in cryptocurrencies as a capital base for the company, for your LLC equivalent, and even pay your taxes in Bitcoin, yeah, in cryptocurrencies. And we are a bit spoiled here in Switzerland because you have two native uh, crypto banks. So I mean that the bank and infrastructure is integrated or native for cryptocurrencies. And we're kind of spoiled if you go around and you pay with your Bitcoin. But this is not the reality around the globe. And I think the one important point that you mentioned is that in my view, Bitcoin cannot be uh, oversighted by a local entity or a local regulatory framework because it's just not how it's envisioned. It's just not how it works. And I will maybe end that on a very interesting anecdote that I had a few years ago when a regulator out of Singapore asked me if there's a client who out of Switzerland who trades with a client out of Singapore, where did the trade happen? I answered where it happened the cloud because this is the reality. You know, this is a global payment infrastructure. Clients trade over the globe. And it doesn't mix, or it doesn't work, even though Singapore and Switzerland had very similar regulatory frameworks and still do. It just doesn't match if you try to actually put a single oversight on top of it. So maybe I'll leave that as an open question, how this can be resolved going forward. Yeah, and one of, I taught sales training and financial services for 30 years, and yes, I'm that old. Uh, one of my sayings is your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. You know, one of the strength of, of, of Bitcoin and the structure of it is it can do many things. It can function as micro payment, regular payment, store of value, asset class. So because it has the strength to do multiple things, it's a weakness because nobody knows how to quantify it. And each agency has their own little fiefdom and terminology they want to wrap around it. And it's, it's like trying to, to herd a bunch of cats when the, the it's one cat doing nine different things. You know, so so Dora, back to you on, on kind of the same question where we're on the you know, is Bitcoin a currency and should it be regulated? And that'll, of course, then segue us into the asset investment side. But that's why I wanted to start first. No, thank you very much. I mean, just taking a quick step back, uh, if you look at the monetary policies and the central bank's policies around the world, until now with the local will establish fiat currencies, there is still a lot of control when it comes to onshore, offshore market. How do you want to manage uh, the currency uh, 
demand and supply control inflation all of that so even with the existing established system uh, banks still even now struggling to see how they want to control their own currencies and how to put restrictions uh, around the world who can trade it who can access dollar or yen and uh, stuff like that but in general um, give you a point of view from genesis at least we have been seeing the adoption of, of, of bitcoin since 2013 on the institutional side and uh, Every day we see it gains more momentum. It's people view it as um, a medium of exchange. Uh, it's gaining a lot more adoption from larger and larger players. So, uh, so like any other currencies, it really has all the major characteristics. Right? When it comes to being scarce, being divisible, its utility, its uh, durability, the counterfeiting aspects. So, um, and we need to remember that Bitcoin became really something because people are uh, really wants to change how the world is working. People did not like how traditional systems are working and the central controlling mechanism. So I don't think we can fight the wave. I think it's an investment vehicle. I think it's a medium of exchange if we like it or not, because we see uh, billions of dollars of exchange, even just at Genesis side every month and uh, people and the supply is limited and the demand is, is high. So it's definitely there to stay. Uh, and maybe just being the first uh, protocol, the simple blockchain, uh, we see it to stay. And I think um, it's, if anything, gaining more momentum. Yeah. And, and again, for me, I've had three public companies. So I have a very distinctive view on things. I Once I figured Bitcoin out, at least in my own mind, I think it's like, you know, gold, a brick of gold's $500,000, a unit of Bitcoin's 50. You can buy a $50 gold coin. It goes up and down. And most people actually don't own gold. They own a certificate telling them they own gold. So it's already digital. You know, debit cards are digital. It's just the way money moves is interesting. It always is digital. It just moves through legacy networks. And blockchain brought up new things. And I think Bitcoin does that to me. Cryptocurrencies aren't currencies. I was on a, a panel in the US about bank regulations. And I said, cryptocurrencies to me are like penny stocks. They're a tradable speculative asset and banks don't regulate speculation. They IRS regulates tax. It's, you know, so again, we're, we're in this kind of amorphous thing moving forward. And if we look at Bitcoin as an investment, right, let's talk about the mechanics of structure of it. Um, Again, without you guys can't estimate price. I can. I did a, a podcast in December. I said, I think it'll go to a hundred thousand. And here's why it was the, the number of wallets that were onboarding the, the demand, you know, the latency, things like that. But let's look at it. Let's look at Bitcoin, not as a function of utility, but as a function of an investment, as an asset class. And, and let's start with that. Steven, I know I'll start back with you on the, you know, this isn't a legal side as much as it is. But it kind of is. If you classify Bitcoin as a as a legal asset, you know, what does that do for price transparency and elasticity? If more regulation comes on, does it slow it down or does it speed it up because more people are comfortable with it as a as a regulated investment vehicle? Well, yeah, you know, in, in the U.S., we have this very fractured regulatory scheme, of course, and you've got, you know, the SEC regulating securities and uh, the CFTC regulating commodities. Of course, the, the SEC is, I mean, it's come out and said they don't believe Bitcoin's a, a, a security. And I think that's the right answer, certainly. Um, but just because something's not a security doesn't mean it's, it's not an investment. So, you know, commodities, you know, like you mentioned, gold, you know, precious metals, Lots of, you know, there are lots of commodity traders out there that, that invest in commodities all day long. And, uh, you know, we had this, you know, in the crypto space generally, we, we had this, you know, everybody's familiar now with the Howey test, uh, I'm sure, you know, about when something can be uh, found to be a security. And, and but one, one thing that's clear with that Howey test is that when it's the broader market creating the value as opposed to a central authority or our enterprise, that's, you know, that's not the sort of expectation of profit that's considered as part of the Howey test. So, so yes, I mean, I think it's clear that these things are commodities um, and the CFTC doesn't, you know, doesn't generally regulate the spot market. They do have enforcement and, you know, anti-fraud authority. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, you know, that, 
that is also something that that's been talked about. You know that there may need to be some additional regulation from the, the CFTC. From you know some folks have made those comments. Um, you know, so that 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 would, I think be the approach. I don't think you would see it from the SEC side, for example. I don't I don't see kind of how you know the, the, the jurisdictional way in for them to to, to approach that. Yeah, and I, I think our industry, you know, blockchain industry as a whole. I, I, we've done a disservice to the industry by naming things because we wanted to be cool. Like when we did the first ICO with MasterCoin, it was ICO like an IPO. Well, an IPO, a public, is a 10-year-old company with billions in revenue. A direct public offering is a small cap. You know, so when you, you call yourself a security token a long time ago, it was Howey Test, right? Utility or security for value. Then they're like, oh, well, let's call it a security token because it's equity or a dividend. There's participation. Well, that then makes you a security and a stock. And like, call yourself something you don't want to be, you know. So, so rather than creating new terminology and trying to move the the, the regulators in a framework, we try and be cool and name it like other stuff. And I, I think it 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 does a disservice. But you know, let's let's jump to Chen and then we'll go Didi or and Anton. Same thing on the the investment side. Again, gold to me is a commodity. You know, not a fixed supply, but somewhat difficult. The, the harder it is to mine, the more expensive it is. There's some parallels to Bitcoin. So from a structural asset, you know, what do you think of it as an investment and, and how would you look at it moving forward? Well, I mean, to your question about regulation, um, you know, and whether it's conducive or not conducive, and I guess what sort of regulation. I think, first of all, there is there is a tendency sometimes in the digital asset in the crypto space, uh, you know, to... To, to be against regulation, but I do think it's important for you know all of us to remember that there's a reason almost nowhere in the world does anyone vote for libertarian governments. And the reason is that people feel more comfortable spending their money when there is some oversight, right? The question is, of course, what kind of oversight? Um, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin, one thing, for example, I mean, you, you also asked about, you know, about price, health, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing that we a, you know, deal with quite often is the question of uh, cross-market manipulation of Bitcoin. How does that affect prices? So, you know, uh, you know, un- you know, unlike uh, uh, gold, Bitcoin is the fr- it's it's really not the, one of the only non-physical assets that's not uh, native to a single exchange. Uh, making you know the question of is it manipulated somewhere that is not regulated very very uh, you know challenging from a regulatory perspective. That of course comes out of how the SEC looks at it in its. Uh, uh, you know, in its rejection of Bitcoin ETF application. Now, if you ask me, uh, regulation is the key to growth of this as an asset class and as an investment class. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, and, and a Bitcoin ETF is just one example. I mean, that can really bring a lot of value into uh, into Bitcoin, in a lot of investment into Bitcoin. Uh, bit, you know, investment in crypto is going to grow because institutions are going to feel comfortable and because the public is going to feel comfortable. Uh, and that requires, you know, some degree of certainty that, uh, you know, you know, you're, you're not being manipulated in, in, in the million, in the, in not million, but in the many non-regulated exchanges. Um, so, you know, that's something that, you know, we're working on with many industry members in order to create consortia and data sharing agreement that allows to try and understand if these things are happening across markets. Um, and again, it goes back to the fact that uh, there are, you know, uh, it's a really exciting uh, new asset class. It's already showing uh, value in a lot of different ways. Um, but in order to grow, it will need to deal with those risks uh, and we'll need to make regulators feel comfortable that, you know, people are not being kind of whole, you know, manipulated on a wholesale level out of their uh, investments. Yeah. And, it, and it's funny because when we talk manipulation, I, I grew up in finance when my buddy John Nigerian goes on and, and promotes a stock or another guy from BlackRock goes on and poo-poo's a stock and, and they're shorting it in the background. Like these guys are always manipulating markets. So, um, but but again, we worked with Malta 2018 and I fought with them. I said, let's not call it regulation. It's even in the attorneys like regulation. I like a framework of innovation. Like give me a framework that gives me structure and compliance. I still want that compliance and in, in the regulatory body, but I want a framework of innovation that right. we can move into. But again, it's all it's all terminology because regulation stifles innovation. You yeah. Know, and if, if it's okay to, just to respond, I mean, no, I, I agree with you, and 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 no one, I think, wants uh, you know regulation that is so aggressive and calling anything manipulation. But at the end of the day, there's also I'm not a lawyer. 
there are lawyers in the room, uh, so I'll let them <laughs> comment on that. But but there's also you know the law, and there are behaviors that are according to the law illegal. Uh, you right. know, uh, as I said, people trust governments to regulate these things. I mean, some of us more, some of us less. But the bottom line is that. None of us, I would assume, voted for a libertarian government, and we prefer to live in places where there are rules. Um, and, uh, and and those rules help make markets, uh, you know, uh, safer. And, and, you know, yep. another thing is, like, crypto is very much about accessibility, and, and that's great. You know, open markets have less regulation, but there's also the question of, is a market accessible if you know, it's very easy to manipulate less savvy actors within it. If you'd ask me, that's not real accessibility. And I'll stop there because I capitalized on the conversation a little bit, but <laughs> I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so let's jump Anton, and then Anton, as soon as you're done, Didi, I'll let you drop in as well. Yeah, so just to mention from an investment perspective, I can uh, reflect or share a little bit kind of how I've seen this evolve over time. And the kind of the way I remember it in 2013, the people who invested into Bitcoins either mined it by themselves or are really huge believers in the technology or the vision. And then they bought Bitcoin, but for the purposes where they were not perhaps anticipating a thousand X or a hundred X or these huge multiples that we're seeing on a day to day basis in crypto. So this is kind of how I saw the first investors into Bitcoins were actually the true believers. And they were sitting on those positions and still sit on those positions, which are massive, but maybe in retrospect in 2013 were actually maybe a few hundred thousand or, or a few tens of thousands of dollars equivalent. Yeah. And kind of what I saw over time was actually that the family offices started coming in quite early on and high frequency trading firms. So today there practically doesn't exist a prop shop or a high frequency trading firm that is not trading it or has been trading it for a long time. And then kind of if I look kind of how we progress across that spectrum is that so we actually, Floftech, we run actually a fund on the side and I actually get asked serious questions by institutional investors. It's a, it's a, it's a product for professional institutionals. And usually even ask me questions like, how does custody work? And until we explain that to them, how does it work? There are so many barriers for actually institutional investors, at least from a European Swiss perspective, to enter this for very practical reasons. Who is the custodian? Who is the paying agent? How does the audit for administration works? And you kind of cannot easily answer those questions to really create like a clear gateway for people to enter that. Now there's always an opportunity into that. And that's why Grayscale identified many, many years ago that maybe the ETF won't come tomorrow, but will come later on. And that's why they capitalized on that with their trust. That's now one of the biggest uh, pro investment products. Globally, it's not the biggest ever. So this is kind of how I see things. And then now when it comes to ETFs, I think you really pointed out a very interesting question around the market structure. Because again, we asked, as a market maker, we get asked questions like, uh, so are you an exchange member? And I tell them, there is no exchange members in the crypto world. Those are all quasi retail brokerage trading platforms that we all trade. And then they tell me, oh, so you have direct market access, but the retail investors don't. And I tell them, no, it doesn't work like that. There is no, the typical market structure that people are used to and the regulators used to just doesn't exist actually. Or it works very different. Now you can argue, is this innovation or is it not innovation actually? Or we are kind of regressing. But I was just saying is like the typical standard setup that an asset manager would like to see before he invests. It just doesn't exist there. Or it's in the early stages and you have some kind of, you have certain service providers that offer that. But I think for kind of like the gateways to open and come in, we're coming, but still not there. And maybe as an, another anecdote, last month we got asked by two Swiss banks, can we market make crypto for them? So ask doesn't mean they're going to do it tomorrow, but they're kind of like thinking about it. And these were not the, your typical biggest uh, two Swiss banks, so just to put that on the side, but kind of the mid-side smaller banks, private banks that are interested into that. And the only reason why they're interested into this is because their clients are interested into this. And if their clients were not interested in this, they would not be talking to us. So this is how yeah, the, they're going to have to because the retail investor, whether it's the, the $50 guy or the 50,000 or the $500,000 guy, they're, they're trying to find their way in to the market. Uh, Dorar, any, anything on your end along this same line of conversation? Yeah, you, there? You, you guys covered a lot of points. I would add, I believe at the end of the day, like Genesis, for example, we have been trading crypto from day one in a regulated fashion. And I believe the biggest risk we might face, not just as a company and at the crypto space, is it's not just, just having the regulatory framework. We are all pushing for a proper regulatory framework that allows innovation and support uh, um, the unique aspect of the uh, blockchain, the decentralized assets. But I believe at the end of the day, uh, sorry, do you hear me? Hello? 
loud and clear. Hello. Gerard, we can hear you. We can see you and hear you. We hear you loud and clear. Oh, uh, we lost. We lost them. So, um, a Anton, I, I always tell a, a joke when you talked about the crypto. I get interviewed sometimes and they're like, oh, Stephen, do you regret not buying Bitcoin earlier? And I look at them deadpan. I say, of course not. I bought it in 2012. I bought a thousand Bitcoin at three dollars. I don't regret not buying it early, but I sure regret selling it at 580. Because, because to me, it was a, okay. I, I'm like, I doubled my money. Day. Yeah. So it was if I would have known a long term hold. And then again, thinking of it like traditional stock, stock would never appreciate to the asset value that a Bitcoin can because stock has to be a certain threshold price. So, you know, again, I think we've all kind of learned along the way different things. Yeah. Dora, if you're back in, go ahead. We can hear you. Sorry. Now. Yeah. Do you hear me now? OK. Yeah. No, I just said uh, we are all supportive of having the right regulatory framework that support the aspect of the blockchain and that's decentralized nature. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest risk is having inconsistent regulatory frameworks globally because the nature of the asset is decentralized and global. And uh, we are all aware of recent example where one regulator classified one asset as a security in the U.S. But uh, in the other part of the world, either went silent or didn't say anything about it. So whether you are a market maker uh, like Genesis as a broker dealer, we can on paper trade security, but there will be no one else on the other side of the world who's going to trade that asset as a security. So so we, we need to really have a consistent framework. I like Stephen's earlier point about the framework of innovation and it's a technology at the end of the day. It's a new medium of exchange. And I would love regulators to work together to at least create a, a world where we can trade at least certain assets in a consistent fashion globally. This yeah, is, and so uh, let's we'll we'll yeah. we'll go down the third rail here, the third lane, and we'll circle back around to Stephen. So so get ready. Uh, again, I, I like the Australian model of bifurcating because Bitcoin can do different things. So don't treat it one under a certain threshold. Let it just act as a currency and payment mechanism. Others treat it like an asset class. But in in a, I, I don't want to call it a perfect world. There is no such thing, Stephen. But moving forward in the the aspect of where we are now. What kind of innovation and structure would you put around Bitcoin to make it more uh, amenable and appeasable to both the regulators for the, the structure and the protection and for the retail investors to gain confidence? Would you put one ser simple wrapper around it or separate? I want each of you to kind of think about if you sat down with the regulators tomorrow or the innovator framework, guys, what would it look like? Well, the, I think the biggest challenge for um, for the regulators is that you know, it, it was, as was mentioned before, in, in the you know, when Anton mentioned, you know, he's not a member of an exchange. You know, the problem is most regulatory regimes are based on a centralized intermediary regulating that centralized intermediary and creating trust as a result. And so, when you get rid of that intermediary then how do you do it? And I think that's, that's really what, what, you know, what they're struggling with now is like, okay, how do we do this uh, without, you know, the structures that we've had in place for many years? And, you know, I, I think the sandbox approach is a, you know, is a good one for regulators. Unfortunately, it really doesn't work in the U.S. because of our very fractured, uh, you know, regime. Uh, you know, the OCC adopted a little, you know, Sandbox, and then the states freaked out that they were, you know, as you mentioned before, Steve, you know, the, it's, it's the fiefdom problem. Everybody's, you know, going to protect their turf. And, you know, instead of, you know, coordinating some, you know, real, you know, at least national, you know, approach. And that, that's, that is the problem. That's why, you know, unfortunately, we are losing, uh, you know, innovation here in the U.S. where, you know, we're, you know, we're pushing it out to other places where it's more clear. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's really, you know, unfortunate. I hope, you know, that, that, uh, you know, there with, with other folks that may have a little more familiarity, you know, Gary Gensler at least has familiarity with, uh, this stuff. Although I, as I said before, I don't think the SEC is really the right place, uh, for regulation, but, you know, I, I would hope that sort of sandboxes, you know, like, you know, the FCA has been fairly successful in the UK with that stuff. 
Uh, you know, that sort of approach is easier, certainly in a more monolithic regulatory regime, you know, like Singapore, the MAS, you know, you, you don't have to worry about all these different fiefdoms. Um, but those are the approaches I think would be, you know, most fertile for figuring out, you know, what's the right way to do it? Because we don't know, clearly. Yeah. And that's a lot of what Malta did when we worked with them is they standardized terminology across multiple industries. So you at least we're, we're playing with the same terms and, and the understanding, you know, let's Anton jump in. So perfect world framework of innovation. What would you wrap around Bitcoin? Yeah. So in a perfect, in an ideal scenario, I think that the leadership role would have the so-called self-regulatory organizations, the ones where you have actually industry experts and industry players, such that the ones that we have here at this panel that really kind of step up and show the innovation and the path, how things can innovate going forward in order to bring the industry and the regulator closer together. And I would just, to kind of wrap it up on my side, I think it's very important that we do that very soon because of the leverage that's currently in the crypto and the digital asset ecosystem. It's a lot higher according, at least to what we see out, it's a lot higher in 2017. It's also leaking or coming from decentralized finance. And I think kind of, we are not in, this is just my personal opinion, maybe this bull run is not over yet. But if we continue with this price movements and increasing that leverage, and we have learned from 2008 that leverage is be a very dangerous weapon if it's used very in an uncontrolled way. I think that we need to really be mindful as industry players that the leverage this time is a lot, lot greater than it was in 2017. We kind of know when the correction happened, how severe that was. And I fear that if we kind of have the same uh, uh, free market approach when it comes to leverage in the crypto world, that the next correction, I mean, uh, proper correction when it comes will be quite severe for a lot of players and maybe exchange ending or protocol ending uh, events will happen when this actually occurs. So I kind of really see, let's bring the, the regulator and the industry closer together through industry experts with the goal really of reducing leverage, because I think that's what we see and uh, clearly identified as the biggest risk from our perspective as a market maker what we see out there. All right, perfect. Chen? Uh, I completely agree that one of the keys is bringing regulators and the industry together. And I had the the real wonderful opportunity to, uh, I was invited by the Department of Financial Services of, of New York to lead a team as part of a tech sprint that they held. And the goal of the tech sprint, it focused on digital asset markets. They proposed, they presented four uh, problem statements. All of them focused on how can DFS use data better in order to uh, more effectively supervise these markets without impeding their growth. Uh, you know, they brought together uh, members of uh, risk monitoring technology firms like myself, regulated entities like Genesis, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, they just, there was just an open call. Uh, and uh, it was really amazing to sit, uh, you know, for two weeks and work shoulder to shoulder with regulators, understanding their problems and them understanding our problems to really try and find solutions. Now, I wanted to bring that up because really the focus there was data. And if you'd ask me, I mean, so first of all, just also to emphasize that, you know, there is more and more of this collaboration. You know, we, Solidus Labs, are, you know, involved in various industry membership organizations. A few of them are aspiring to become SROs, either on a global or local level. Um, I agree completely, Anton. But, you know, but, but really, from, but, but also one thing that's really, really important is simply mo moving financial risk monitoring into the future. Uh, you know, by first of all, unifying data, unifying frameworks, uni unifying standards, uh, you know, that was alluded to. And second of all, becoming much better at processing all of this data together in order to become surgical in understanding where actual malicious be behavior lies. Financial, financial services to a large degree has you know, the, the, the risk monitoring really relied on the ability to bar people from entering the system and using them. Um, you know, Bitcoin and digital assets are about opening those uh, a, a opportunities. And uh, the, the way to enable that is by becoming very surgical in identifying uh, challenge, in identifying uh, risk in a much more precise way. So I'll stop there, uh, but just those few points. Yeah, so Dora, let's do this. Let, let's have you answer that as well. Um, if you can in a minute or two, and then uh, I'm going to wrap up with everybody for about yes. 60 seconds with their own closing statements. You know, so no, Dora, of course. Go ahead. I mean, you know, I mean, again, you guys really covered all the good points, but I would say <laughs> at, at this point, yeah, I mean, we really want to to. I mean, as institutions like Synergies, like Genesis, like uh, all companies, we need to really um, help legitimize this asset class a bit more. And we are doing everything possible from 
and uh, KYC, KYT, uh, working with regulators uh, to, to really um, share the use cases as well. Uh, crypto now is very different than crypto 2013 and 14 and 15. We have much larger players. We have uh, real funds, uh, treasury corporate treasurers who are investing, long-term investors in the asset class. Uh, we are working on uh, custody, as um, we mentioned earlier, and all those things really uh, help us understand where those assets are, who is utilizing them, what the purpose of it. And, and I think it's a lot of good data points for regulators to understand how do we even need to regulate this market going forward in a scalable fashion. Uh, I think the asset is there and we really need to just be pragmatic and deal with it uh, in the best way that protect people and protect their investments at the same time, um, uh, you know, uh, utilize this fantastic technology and help us to grow. So Perfect. So let's... It. Let's, yeah. we're, we're, we're going to bump up against time here. So Stephen, you know, 30, 60 seconds, just kind of closing thoughts on the industry moving forward. Well, I, I think there's been some good ideas uh, raised here. I mean, I, I certainly would hope that, that uh, self-regulatory type organizations uh, continue to develop and, you know, kind of lead the way in terms of what, what regulation can look like. And then, you know, and I hope that, that, you know, sovereign governments can, can coordinate more than, than they have to date so that we have more of a unified approach across uh, jurisdictions. Yeah, perfect. Chen, 30, 60 seconds, somewhere in there. Oh, mute. And there goes a sixth of my time, but uh, uh, it's, about, it's about unifying standards, unifying data, um, and becoming much more effective in, in monitoring for risk uh, that's the bottom line uh, from our perspective. Yeah, Anton? So we spoke today a lot about this Bitcoin speculation, a bubble, spoke a lot about risks. So let me end on a positive note. In my view, Bitcoin, blockchain technology, and decentralized solutions are the biggest opportunity we're going to see in our lifetime. And I think players like we have in this panel show the way how to go forward. So I couldn't be more optimistic going forward and couldn't be more bullish on the whole industry. Perfect. Duar? I agree with Anton, and uh, I definitely, we see a lot of more forward thinking regulators now, Australia, New York, PFS, OCC, and uh, the space is flourishing and moving, and we also continue to collaborate and service our clients and get stay compliant and regulated. So we will continue on this path uh, for the best of everyone. Which yeah, I think I think it'll it'll move forward. I use a term. Um, I was just in Black Magazine in Dubai. I use a term called retrospective evolution. You know, how do we look backwards into things that have worked in the past with direct tokens, direct public offerings, regulatory? Even Stephen in the U.S., we created the Jobs Act, right? And the Jobs Act allowed you to crowdfund for equity. Well, if I invest as an angel in equity, I'm stuck in that company for three, four, five years. Majority of them fail, and they usually fail because they don't have money. If I could crowdfund into a token round and potentially have liquidity, the structure actually protects more participants. So I, I think we're slowly going to start moving things forward. We're going to move the industry forward. Um, more guys like yourselves just kind of leading the charges been great stuff so thanks to everybody there thanks for for tuning in and hopefully we'll get to do a harass us in person i, I miss every, seeing Still everybody in person. Yes. thank Perfect. you thank you very much thanks guys it was a pleasure all right, all right. thank you bye-bye